There was an additional uh, update actually on a prayer request, and that is Regina Segetti, who attends here with us. She had surgery. She's also, by the way, in the announcement bulletin as a prayer request. She had surgery on Thursday. They re removed a small tumor, and it went very well. The tumor was smaller than they had envisioned or thought it would be, so it went very well, and she is home with her daughter now. Also, a correction of a correction. I gave you my wife's email address incorrectly. It, it's debbiecoons51 at gmail.com. Again, debbiecoons51 at gmail.com. I think that's it for the corrections and updates and so forth. Coffee. When I say coffee, everybody pretty much has a good picture idea of what we're talking about. There are not, uh, there's not much vagary in coffee. We know what it is. We have a mental picture of a hot drink with a pleasing aroma that most people or a lot of people like. Some are more addicted to it than others or like it better than others, whichever way you want to put it or phrase it. But uh, I do like it, and as I mentioned, a lot of people do. But we think, when, when I say coffee, we think of something in, in particular, a particular drink, a hot drink, or now it could be a cold drink, an ice drink. That didn't used to be the case. I, uh, uh, you know, when our coffee got cold, we used to throw it out. But now, I guess we add a couple ice cubes, and we have iced coffee, and it's part of the in thing now. There are so many different kinds of coffee, or I don't know if they're actually called coffee. They're hot drinks anyway that are in the coffee line. Latte, cappuccino, mocha, macchiata, uh, even coffee juice. And I know they have a concentrated liquid coffee that you can buy in a bottle in some places that you take. I'm told it's not very good. I've never had it. But it's, uh, it's, it is available in some places that you can use and make an instant coffee similar probably to the one that you, ones that you would get in a, um, in, a, in a dry powder form, but maybe this one mixes up a little better. I'm not quite sure about that. But there are so many different ones, hot and cold, that it's hard to keep up with. I heard somewhere that the seasonal coffee that Starbucks does, which this fall will be pumpkin, and that's their most, um, I guess that's their, their number one seasonal coffee, that they expect to do $81 million worth of business in their pumpkin coffee, seasonal pumpkin coffee, this fall. So somebody, a lot of people, are drinking a lot of coffee which is okay. I guess um, it helps the little plantations. And I, I hear plant coffee plantations, and I th always envision, when, you, when I think of a plantation, I'm thinking thousands of acres. But a coffee plantation is probably a lot of them are maybe five acres or less. And they may be on a mountainside somewhere. They, they claim that the best coffee comes at a certain altitude on the mountain, that it, in a, at a certain place on the mountain, produces the best coffee of all. And that, that perhaps is true. I, I don't know where um, exactly, I didn't see where the coffee was, but we went to Hawaii one year and we had Kona coffee and it was good. And I think they might raise, or be, it might be grown on partway up the mountain. But in any way, coffee pictures, when we talk about coffee and think about coffee, it, it brings a mental image to our mind. And now, mostly of hot, but now also probably of cold. But there's one thing missing in coffee that I've never really heard advertised, or at least have never heard anybody try to, to sell, because I think it would be a hard sell, a difficult sell, and that is lukewarm coffee. It just doesn't sound appealing. I had some coffee this morning, and I do most mornings. And most of the time, before I get finished drinking it, 
it tends to be lukewarm. And all, most of the time, I don't actually finish it. I dump it out because I don't like lukewarm coffee. Most people don't like lukewarm things to begin with. And I don't think that Laodicean coffee would sell very well. I don't think it, it uh, would be very appealing to most people. But like coffee, when I, when I say Laodicea, we also have a mental image. We know pretty close to what we're talking about, and Laodicea and lukewarm seem to go hand in hand. It's pretty much what we get in our mind when we, when we say that particular word, Laodicea, because it creates an image in our mind that we uh, think of, or a picture that we think of. So today, I'm not going to talk about Laodicea. I'm going to talk about the seventh church. And that's the title of my message is the seventh church. But it's not about church eras. That's also another thing that when we talk about the seven churches in Revelation, that's one of the first things that comes to mind is church eras and church letters to the churches and so forth. It's not about eras. Uh, some people believe, and, and there's probably a lot of validity to it, that there's, there are eras of the church, that the church is, at certain points along the way had certain types of attitudes, if you will, or certain types of a culture that may have been prevalent at that particular time. And as you go through the list of the seven churches from Ephesus to Smyrna and Pergamon and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and then Laodicea, they all have their own distinct individual uh, characteristics as you read in uh, Revelation 2 and 3. But that's, we're not really going through the seven churches or we're not going to address necessarily eras and, and uh, so forth, uh, possibly touch on attitude some, but uh, that's not the point of this message, the seventh church message. It's not criticism or correction either. It's not to be critical of, of a, a particular congregation. What, one of the things that's always sort of interesting, when you talk about the seven churches, I've never heard a church that calls itself the Laodicean Church of God. Everybody wants to be the Philadelphia Church of God, and it's easy to see why when you read the messages to the churches. And there are lots of, actually, there are quite a few churches of God that call themselves Philadelphia, one thing or another, but nobody wants to be anything but Philadelphia. But this is about a cultural environment that existed in the seventh church and that we can learn from that would help us to avoid the trap that they fell into. Because they did fall into a little bit of a trap. They ended up um, um, being or sort of uh, adopting that culture that they were related to or that was there. We'll start out in uh, Revelation 1, Revelation 1 in, in verse 1, and just to get a little bit of the picture of what's going on, it says this is the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place and that shortly can be taken in several ways. It could mean quickly or swiftly. Uh, maybe not so much shortly in terms of time, but, sh but quickly and swiftly as they un um, unfold to take place. And, and he sent and signified by his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. And in, um, in, in God's way of thinking, now this, this probably took place close to 2,000 years ago when this, this was written, and so it wouldn't seem like that's near to us, but in the time frame of God's thinking, where a day is like a 1,000 years and a 1,000 years like a day, it's, it's probably much nearer than what we think. Dropping on down to verse 11, it says, 
he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. And this again is Jesus Christ talking. If you have a red letter Bible, it'll probably be in red letters. The first and the last. What you see, and he's speaking to John, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. To Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Now, two things to keep in mind here as we go through a couple of things. One thing is, all the messages were for all the churches. These were not letters, single letters that were written and addressed to the church and then sent out. They were, in a, he said to put them, write them in a book and send the whole book to all seven of the churches or it may have been an, on a circular mail route because that's sort of how they were. They were in sort of not quite a half circle but they were in somewhat of a uh, uh, you start up and then come back down and Laodicea, Ephesus is here and Laodicea is down here in this picture. And the, all the messages were to go to all the churches. That's one thing to keep in mind. The second thing that we want to keep in mind is that we have choice, that we can choose. We can choose what attitude that we would want to have, that we would like to have. We can choose whether we would have the same kind of attitude or the same thing happen to us as happened to the, the seventh church, the people in the seventh church. We can choose. We have that choice to, keep, to do that. And we can, we can make the choice that we're not going to be like that. We're going to do something else. It's interesting that Laodicea and, and the, the uh, book of Revelation where we find all this seems to be the book of sevens. The, the uh, seven stars, the seven lampstands, the seven candles, the seven churches, the seven trumpets, the seven seals, and so on and so forth. It seems to be, a, have a heavy emphasis, emphasis on seven, and Laodicea is mentioned seven times in the Bible, all in the New Testament. The first time, and we'll turn there, it's Colossians uh, 2, and we'll read verses 1 to 3. Colossians 2, verses 1 to 3, and I hope I can find it here. <clears throat> Colossians 2, and verse 1, and this is Paul writing, of course, to the church of, uh, of, the, of the Colossians, and he said, For I want you to know what a great conflict or struggle that I have for you and those in Laodicea. He wanted, he really wanted to get there to see them, and he was worried about them. And, and for as many, uh, for you and, again, to emphasize, and those in Laodicea, you being the Colossian church, and for as many as have not seen me, my face in the flesh. He really wanted to get there. He wanted to be there. That their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And there's, there's while he was worried and concerned about him, and he expressed that here, there's no indication that there was at this point anything wrong with the um, folks in that area with that church. But, because he, he goes on in verse um, 5, he said, For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you have therefore, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving, and here's what he's worried about. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the word and world and not according to Christ. So he, he, was, he was worried that they would slip away some from the faith, but there's no indication that they started out in the condition they ended up in, obviously, because... Uh, 
a church normally wouldn't do that. That's usually a progression that goes the other way. It starts here and then starts downhill. And that's normally how, how it happens. But let's talk a little bit about the seventh church and what this, where this church was and what um, their environment was. Because their environment had a great deal, had a lot to do with what happened to them and why they were addressed the way they were in um, uh, th the third chapter of Revelation. They were an important trade and communication center. They, um, they, were in, they were inland probably, I guess, 100 miles or so from the Aegean or the Mediterranean Sea to the east, and they were on an important trade route. There was a big Roman road that went right through their town heading into the interior of Asia Minor from the seaports. Ephesus and some of the other seaports along the, the eastern shore of the Mediterranean. And those were important trade routes because a lot of the commerce ended up happening, being transported by sea and then going over overland with uh, camel routes and so forth on some of the major roads. And obviously they didn't have the freeway or highway system that we do today they were much more there were much fewer and they weren't as good as what we what we see now but Rome did build roads and this was um, they were Laodicea was on a direct east west route from from the, the Mediterranean into the interior of Asia so that road went right through there and then there was also uh, the the shore the coast went sort of in a circular uh, or semi-circular uh, route with jagged edges sticking out into the Mediterranean and so forth. But there was also a north-south road that went through there as well. And they were important in terms of trade communi and communication because their communication system was generally, a lot of it was word of mouth or it would tend to be possibly in letters such as John was writing or in this, his case a book that John was writing and sending around to different places and, and a letter or a, or a book or any kind of communication might go from one place to the next to the next to the next unlike what we do today because that same letter might have to touch a lot of people and or, or was supposed to touch a lot of people and as it went it would go and make stops and then it was sent on and so forth. Perhaps it might have been copied at the place where its destination was. But anyway, it was a tr major trade center and communication center in that part of the world. Another thing that it was was a banking center. It had apparently a large banking business going on because uh, Cicero and others had cashed, uh, according to the information that's available, had cashed checks. And most of this information comes from the Expo Expositor's Bible Commentary and from the Holman Bible Atlas and uh, several other sources. But they all seem to corroborate each other that, the, that this information, that this is what kind of a city that this was. That it was a heavy banking center which causes it or gives you the indication that it was rather wealthy, that it was rich, it had lots of money, and where money is, there's lots of people trying to get the money, so you'll have a lot of people getting back and forth into that particular town, into that particular area. Another thing that it was well known for was its glossy or shiny black wool. It was a textile center as well. It, it They created or had um, a lot of textile industry in that town. And they were famous or semi-famous for their shiny black wool. Uh, it's not known whether the wool began being as out or started out as being black or whether it was dyed to be black. But it was of a very, very high quality for its day apparently. And that also caused it to be a very important area for trade and commerce because it had something, it wasn't just bringing products in, it was shipping products out. 
in textiles, especially this, this uh, particular famous wool was one of the big things that was done in that city. Another uh, famous um, thing was they had a, a medicinal or a med college of medicine there, a school of medicine in um, the city that manufactured eye salve and ear ointments, and they were very famous for that as well. Now, apparently, it was in conjunction with the, a, um, a temple that was there for, with the, the god of healing, and I think the, the god's name was Kenmaru or something of that order or nature, and that particular god had a, they, they had a temple where they worshiped that god. Of course, we know that it wasn't the real god. It was some, some uh, phony piece of wood or stone. But nonetheless, that was in the city with their college or, or school of medicine where they made the eye salve and where they made the ear, the ointment uh, for shipping out. And that was another important part of what the the uh, trade, why it was such an important trade center, because they were shipping these medicines out into other areas. And they also were a big worshiper of the god Zeus. He was, he was worshiped in that town. He was the primary, as he was in other areas, he was the primary god of the, of the area, the, um, the, the god of um, of uh, Zeus, which I believe was the supreme god, I believe, in, in, um, uh, of worship, in, in, not just in that area, but probably all over the world, I guess. But they did have one shortcoming. They were they, uh, a metropolis with a cosmopolitan area with a mixture of, of um, uh, they were a melting pot like the United States of America is called a melting pot, and they were. All kinds of cultures were intermingling back and forth, in and out, th uh, through, the, through um, the town doing business and bringing in goods and so forth, or banking and whatnot. But they did have one big shortcoming. They had a poor water supply. And this actually has a bearing on, uh, on the the um, verses we'll read in Revelation as we go along. And that was they had a six mile long aqueduct which brought, you guessed it, lukewarm water into the city of very poor quality. And you might, you might see that as we go along. You might see that as bearing on some of the things we'll read. So this was the backdrop of the town of Laodicea, the seventh church. It was why Paul was concerned, because they had a lot of influence. Ephesus also did. Some of the other towns also uh, did, uh, or some of the other seven churches also had bad influences. And I imagine they were chosen, all these um, cities, because there were other towns in the area that also had churches, but these seven were handpicked by Christ for special attention, and I'm guessing for, for a purpose, because they probably all brought something, an attitude that needed to be addressed, and I'm guessing this was the best way to do it. But this is why Paul was so concerned, because he was not able to get there. He was not able to uh, go up there personally, but he knew the influences that were in the area. He knew what was happening there, and he knew that it was not good, and that it could, without strong uh, continued teaching, it could, it could affect them. He was, as, I, as it is today, there was a manpower shortage, and as Christ said in, um, I believe it was Matthew, forget where, 9 something, maybe 937 or something like that, he said the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And I'm guessing that's part of, the, part of the problem Paul was experiencing and that he was afraid of, that the, that the bad influences would corrupt the good manners of the, the folks up there in Laodicea. But we'll read, we'll read through Revelations, Revelation 3, and beginning in verse 14 of Revelation 3, 
We read, this, we read the story there in Revelation 3.14, beginning there. We'll read through 17. But we begin to see the issues that were addressed and what happened and why, why um, Paul should have been concerned because this was much later on down the line. John being the last apostle and he was on the Isle of Patmos and this is where his, the vision came from. So, so he wrote this down in beginning in verse 14 and to the angel or the messenger as it says of the seventh church, the church of Laodiceans. These things says the amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. This, this is who started the creation of God because all things were created by Jesus Christ. I know your works, he said, and you are neither cold nor hot, just like that cup of coffee that has been sitting out too long and it's now lukewarm. You are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are luke warm and neither cold nor hot I will vomit you out of my mouth the King James says this is the new King James the King James says that I will spew you out of my mouth and because you are neither cold nor hot because there's not much of a market for a lukewarm because you say I am rich have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. The society around them had rubbed off on them. It, we'll just quickly turn back to Matthew 24 and in verse 12. This is the famous sermon, or sermon on the, or not Sermon on the Mount, I'm sorry, the Olivet Prophecy. One of the two big uh, messages that Christ gave in, in his, uh, at least the ones we have recorded. And in verse 12 he said, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. So because of the surrounding attitudes, the surrounding society, and it's the same way today. If you look around us, we can say, yeah, we're rich. In this country, we are more blessed than any other country in the world still today. Even our poor, the poor among us have more, generally speaking, than a lot of the uh, wealthier people in other, other countries. So we still are very, very rich and very, very blessed in this country with, with all kinds of material things. But those material things also have a disadvantage, just as he said there in verse 12 of Matthew 24. Lawlessness, or that society around us, iniquity, as um, the King James says, because it abounds, the love of many becomes cold. We have all our gadgets, we have everything that we can ever think of. We, we were just talking before services about the smartphones and all the toys and gadgets and things we have that we have thought in the past, we thought that was, uh, you know, for um, science fiction. We used to see, I forget who it was, that had a, had a watch he could talk to and uh, on his wrist. Well, now we have those. We have uh, um, gadgets of every kind. We have all our stores full of food. We have all the clothing we could want. We don't need the black wolf from Laodicea. We got clothes that's already made. In those days, they would have to buy the cloth and make their own, generally. But now, we don't even have to do that. There are so many distractions in this life today that it's hard not to be pulled into it. It's hard not to, to be affected by it. It's almost impossible not to be affected by it. But we have to look at it and we have to keep it at arm's length and we have to make up our mind. We have to decide that this is not for me. Certain, we, we, can, you know, we can do certain things, but there are certain things that we probably need to avoid. And if we find ourselves getting addicted to it like we would a cup of coffee, if we find ourselves getting addicted to it, then maybe we should start pulling away from it and going in another direction. But if this, this has been going on since time began. 
Adam and Eve were no different. They were affected by their environment. They saw the trees out there good for, look good for food, the tree of uh, good and evil, and also the tree of life, the tree of good and evil look good, and sure enough, here comes a salesman that, that is trying to exploit that particular emotion that they have about that tree. Of course, we know who it was, Satan the devil, but nonetheless, here he comes, and, he's, and he is uh, trying to confirm what they already might be thinking. And wow, wouldn't it be nice to taste that fruit? It looks so good. And he was able to do it. They were affected by their environment. And they were not the only ones. Pretty much across the board, if you read all the way through the Old Testament, if you read about the, the children of Israel coming out of, uh, and we heard a little bit about Moses and read about him. But if, you, if we read all those, all those um, stories, you could see constantly how they were affected by their environment, that, those things around them. We'll go to look at one example in 1 uh, Kings, in verse, um, or I'm sorry, we'll start in s chapter 16, but we'll hopscotch around just a little bit. This is a familiar, very familiar story, actually. It has to do with Ahab and Elijah, uh, just to get the, the gist of it here in verse 30. Of First Kings 16 <clears throat> it says, Now Ahab the, the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all those that were before him. And then we'll go to 17.1, which should be just another page forward, or maybe it's on the same page. It says, Now, and this is where we meet up with Elijah. Elijah was a, was a, uh, pretty rough looking character. I think he dressed in leather and he, he was pretty, uh, he probably, if he were here today, he'd probably come riding, riding in on a Harley, I'm guessing, and with a beard and, and whatnot. And we might, we, we might not um, recognize him as, as part of our culture. But he was pretty tough. He was uh, probably the kind of person, as they say, that would wear his clothes out from the inside. And Elijah the Tishbite, he showed up of the inhabitants of Gilead, and he said to Ahab, now remember Ahab was worse than all those who had come before him, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. And if you have a, if you have a rain gauge on a, on a um, very dewy morning, you might get an eighth of an inch of moisture in that rain gauge just from dew. But here, for three and a half years, there was neither dew nor rain. So it was a, it was a very, very dry and parched time. Three and a half years is a long time to go without water. Then skipping on over to verse, eight, or, uh, verse 1 of chapter 18, it came to now, he, he, and it goes on and says a few things about Elijah, what he did in between here. But in verse 1 of 18, it says, It came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. Now, James, the book of James in chapter 5, mentions Elijah that he was a man similar to us of like passions, but he prayed to God and said it didn't rain for three and a half years because of his prayer to God. But here, then, the rain is going to come again. In verse 8, he was telling Obadiah, he said, Go and tell your master, Elijah is here. And uh, I'm guessing, well, I know that Obadiah didn't, uh, when, he, when, he, when he heard this, he wasn't exactly excited about it. He was a little bit like Moses. He didn't want to go and tell King Ahab, that Elijah is back because Ahab didn't like him and he said he'll probably kill the messenger. But Elijah promised him that wouldn't happen. Then it happened when Ahab, in verse 17, I'm sorry, uh, dropping down to, to verse 17, it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, is that you, O troubler of Israel? Because Ahab did not like Elijah. He didn't uh, care for him at all. But Elijah told him, I says, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have. 
in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. In other words, you have uh, given in to the society around you. And that's why they constantly were told, don't have interaction with those around you. Don't do that because it will eventually bring you down. It will eventually draw you in and you will do what they do instead of the other way around. <coughs> Excuse me. And dropping down from uh, there to verse 21. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long, and here's, here's the thing, How long will you falter between two opinions? In other words, how long are you going to be either hot or cold? And mostly cold, it might be added. How long are you going to do that? How long are you going to have that opinion? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And of course, we, we know the story, we'll rehearse it just a little bit, it, how he called all the, um, the prophets of Baal and built, uh, they had, both had their altars and, and Elijah put uh, his offering on one and, and they put their offering on the other one and he said, whoever calls fire down from heaven, that will be the one who the real, who's, whose God is the real God. And of course, he... Uh, they were chanting and dancing and screaming and carrying on for hours. Nothing happened. And so he said, oh, he said, you better call out louder, Elijah said, because maybe, maybe they fell asleep. Maybe they're taking a nap, your gods. Maybe something's happening and they've gone off visiting somewhere. Maybe they're not at home. Just keep on. And uh, they started, they cut themselves in some ritual cuttings that they were accustomed to doing. But nothing happened. And we, are, of course, know that. And then finally, when um, Elijah, when they were all finished, then Elijah, he, he put his offering on the, on the altar, poured water on it, poured water on, on uh, a trench, filled a trench, and poured water all the way, filled it all, all the way up with water. And then he called fire from heaven, and fire came down, consumed his offering as well as all the water around it. And so he said, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt, verse 38, and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench that they put around there. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Now, of course, they did that, but this too was short-lived. But like I mentioned, this story repeats itself from Genesis through Revelation, as we read in, um, in verse uh, 14 through 17 of Revelation 3. But let's go to Exodus 34. In Exodus 34, we get a little more of this particular story. Exodus 34, we'll start in verse 11 and we'll read through verse 16. And we'll see again that this just seems to continue to continue and to continue. Uh, <coughs> here, it's more commandments. Observe in verse 11, it says, Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I am driving out from before you the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Parasite, and the Hevite, and the Jebusite. Take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land when you are going, lest it be a snare in your midst. He warned them about them. He told them it was going to happen. But you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images. Don't leave those things out there that would tempt you in... Um, I forget where it was in Ephesians, maybe, or one of the Paul's writings, he said, I should have written it down. He said, make not provision for the flesh. Don't leave those things by where which you might be tempted or the, those things that give you trouble. Stay away from them and shy away from them and get rid of them. And that's what he's saying here. He says, you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images. For you shall worship no other god for the Lord, but the Lord, for the, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make, and that was an inset, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and 
they play the harlot with their gods and make sacrifice to their gods and one of them invites you and you eat of his sacrifice and you take of his daughters for your sons and his daughters play the harlot with their gods and make your sons play the harlot with their gods. You shall make no molded image or no molded gods for yourself. In other words, get rid of anything and that included those altars and those shrines and those uh, many times as you read through first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, especially first and second Kings and first and second Chronicles, many times you will see a king come along and he did everything he said and he was better than the one before but he didn't get rid of the high places they still sacrificed on the high places well here he had told them to get rid of those things and this is an instruction for us get rid of we need to get rid of the things that cause us to stumble that tend to put a um, something in our way that would cause us to be drawn in to doing the wrong things or maybe it just takes our time Maybe it takes more time than we have to devote to it and draws us away from spending the time we should, whether it's studying God's word, praying, fasting, uh, all those kind of things, reading, reading the word and so forth. Maybe, as has been said, maybe if Satan can't do anything else, if he can't get you any other way, he'll waste your time. And that's exactly true. So as he was saying here, we need to get rid of those things that would cause stumbling blocks for us. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul writes, and I know we, we read this a lot of times or part of this when we, during the Passover season, 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, but Paul says, and we'll, we'll start in verse 1 and read through verse 6. He says, Brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. Uh, and they, that happened back in Exodus where we were reading, of course. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. In other words, they all died in the wilderness. Now, here's the conclusion. These things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. As he said back there, in Exodus where we just were in Exodus 34 he said get rid of those things that provide a temptation for us or for them but they didn't and they were ensnared again in verse 11 it says all these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come so for people who say obviously that the Old Testament is irrelevant Paul must not have gotten the message because here he is saying that's exactly why those things were written so that we could see them and so that we could take admonition from them and avoid those same mistakes that they made. <coughs> Even a bad example can be helpful. An example of um, like, like the seventh church was, the church in Laodicea, even that can be helpful. It can be uh, to our advantage to study it, to look at it, as Paul here writes about the example of those who were who did not do what they should have back in in uh, Exodus and so forth, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and so on. <clears throat> the seventh church, as do the other six, can give us insights into how to conduct our life and what to watch out for. And we should. We should take a look at what they had. They, they were in a society that was not only very modern for their day, but they were very, uh, they were a society that did all the wrong things, or a lot of the wrong things, and there were a lot of temptations in their society as there is in our society today. They were, they were tempted in all things um, 
in a lot of things like we are today. Maybe not with the exact same things, but in the same ways, just like Adam and Eve were. And this gives insight into what to look out for and to avoid. Their environment shaped them instead of them shaping their environment. Now, there are certain things you can't do to shape your environment beyond, beyond your own household or your own sphere of influence. You can't do a whole lot. But nonetheless, they allow the outside to come in and shape them instead of them resisting and keeping their mind focused on the target. They did not, they did not um, keep their minds occupied with the things that God had told them to do. They did not get rid of the temptations that were all around us or all around them and avoid being sucked in and drawn in by that. We have, as I mentioned in the beginning, we have two things. We, we, these were all written for our admonition, for our examples, every one of the churches, but especially we can look at the, the seventh church here, the church at Laodicea, and see what happened to them as they interacted with their society. And the second thing is we can choose it doesn't matter if this is an era of Laodicea or not. We, can, we do not have to participate. We don't have to be part of it. We can choose not to be of that attitude, and we can choose not to be that way and not to allow that to happen to us. Lukewarm is not good. Nobody really likes lukewarm. In, in verse 20, back to Revelation 3, in verse 20, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. We always have the opportunity. The door is always open for us to come to Christ. And here is what he said to all seven of the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne to him who overcomes. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And the second thing he said was, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. So, whether it's coffee or our spiritual life, keep it hot. <laughs> 